uh, now it's a great honor to introduce you to Ken Ross, the former executive director of Human Rights Watch. Ken is a Yale lawyer who joined Human Rights Watch, one of the leading human rights organizations since 1987. His achievements of this organization, then a small one, are enormous. Over the course of 30 years, Ken developed Human Rights Watch to a globally recognized and respected organization with many locals around the world. He started to use intensively the new social media to spread the message of human rights effectively. The list of his spectacular successes is long and we are looking forward to hear about from you more. Very welcome, Ken. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Christina. I have to admit, when Christina asked me to come here, I accepted with some trepidation. <laughs> because, you know, I, I know something about politics, about human rights, I suppose even about hope. And I, I couldn't do my work for 30 years without hope. But when it comes to art, I'm a novice. <laughs> so I'll do my best before you, but bear with me. I will start on comfortable terrain. And I want to talk at the beginning about the global contest that we're in the middle of between democracy and autocracy. And the common wisdom these days is that autocracy is ascendant. Democracy is in decline. You know, the, the view is, oh, democracy, it's too slow. It's too messy. It's too divisive. You know, we need a strong man to get things done. Now, the world isn't so simple. And in many ways, these two guys have become exhibit A in what is wrong with autocracy. Because when you surround yourself with sycophants, with yes-men, when you suppress dissent, when you disallow criticism, you tend to make bad decisions. Putin invades Ukraine. You know, Xi Jinping pursues zero COVID lockdowns. Now, these kinds of you know, self-serving, uncorrected, disastrous decisions tend to spawn popular discontent. And so, while the common wisdom is that the autocrats are doing great, when you ask the people on the street, they're not so happy. And you have these massive pro-democracy demonstrations in Hong Kong. You have huge anti-war protests in Russia. You have protests against President Lukashenko's theft of the election in Belarus. You have massive protests against the Myanmar junta's suppression of the democratic aspirations of the people of Burma. And you can say the same thing around the world. In Sudan, huge popular uprisings against the dictatorship of Omar al-Bashir and then against the military coup that stifled the spawning democracy there. In Uganda, President Museveni clung to power only by suppressing the insurgent candidacy of Bobby Wine, a, a rapper turned politician who galvanized the people of Uganda. In Cuba, people had it with the economic malaise of the endless dictatorship there. In Nicaragua, people didn't buy the idea that the Ortegas should rule Nicaragua forever. And so, when the autocrats kind of look out in the world, it is a hostile terrain. People aren't buying the idea that autocratic rule is superior. Now, the band of autocrats always have each other. 
they can band together. They have the Autocrats Mutual Support Club. But it's lonely. Now, up until now, the autocrats thought that they had the solution. They knew that elections helped to secure legitimacy. They helped to demonstrate popular support. But they were going to use what came to be known as managed democracy. They were going to tilt the playing field. <laughs> so they would suppress media. They would shut down protests. They would disband opposition political parties. But it didn't work. It turns out that even managed democracies were unreliable. Here's Cambodia's autocrat, Hun Sen. You can't trust what goes on when people vote secretly, even when genuine political opposition is stymied. And so what you have instead is people claiming electoral vi victory. Here's Maduro of Venezuela. I won the election, but nobody believes him. It was an electoral sham. It conferred you know, none of the legitimacy that he sought. It was an empty electoral charade. And so what you have are mere zombie democracies. They may have an occasional electoral event, but no legitimacy comes with it. And so the autocrats, you know, they still need some semblance of popular support. They can never, you know, suppress everybody. So they try to demonstrate the inevitability of their rule. They, you know, they show these regimented scenes. This is Xi Jinping, you know, being proclaimed basically leader for life, the new emperor of China. And they hope to just cow us, you know, either by these, you know, automatons who are standing behind them, all demonstrating their support, or sometimes just, you know, sheer military might. And the idea is to scare us, you know, to show that the autocrats are there forever, that it is futile to combat them. Now, the idea is to crush our spirit, to show that you know, resistance is, is pointless. Now I'm going to come to art. Art is the opposite of autocracy. And by that I mean is that artistic creativity is the opposite of the unthinking conformity that the autocrats need to survive politically and that they try to instill in us. They do this through various tools. One is to wipe out culture. This is Ukraine. You know, this is a Ukrainian museum that had been under Russian occupation where they just took everything away. What Ukrainian culture? Just submit to Russian authority. Autocrats also, you know, typically, resort to censorship. You know, we don't want you artists doing your thing. Here's Cuba. Um, this is an artist protesting against Decree 349, which said that um, there can be no art without governmental approval. In other words, you know, no art unless you're a propagandist or you delve into irrelevancies, but none of that creative spirit that the dictators try to abolish. Now, I think we are traditionally used to thinking of art as a way of portraying repression. And, you know, art can be more powerful than words. Um, I had this experience at Human Rights Watch where we typically wrote reports you know, these detailed analyses of what a government was doing wrong. And those were powerful, you know, they worked. But about 10 years ago, actually very much with the help of, of Maya Hoffman, we began to introduce a visual element. And we would always accompany our reports with photographs or increasingly videos. 
And you know, at first, the researchers at Human Rights Watch would protest, you know, how can you dumb down my beautiful, detailed exegesis of governmental repression into a dumb three-minute video? You know, until they realized that hundreds of more people, hundreds of times more people, viewed the video than ever read the report. That, that you know, artistic portrayal, visual portrayal of anything, can be much more powerful than simply the written word. And, and we've seen this. So you know, here is his Goya's 3rd of May, you know, commemorating the Spanish resistance to Napoleon's armies. And you know, this wasn't a description, this wasn't a photograph, but it's powerful. It shows us you know, the defiance of the man, the, the cruelty of the effort to snuff out human rebellion, the human quest for freedom. And, and we're familiar with images of this sort, artistic efforts to portray repression. You know, we all know Guernica. Um, and, and there's, you know, you, you can describe indiscriminate bombardment, you can take photographs of indiscriminate bombardment, but there is something about Picasso's portrayal of just the horror of discriminant bombardment that rests with us. You know, today it could have described Mariupol in Ukraine under um, Russian indiscriminant bombardment. And indeed, this has been such a powerful message that it spawned replicas. Um, this is, you know, a Syrian artist's rendition of Guarnica. You'll notice Assad in there. Um, this is describing the indiscriminate bombardment of eastern Aleppo using the same tools that, that Picasso was, was decrying with his original painting. Now, because we're here in Switzerland, I thought I would um, show another less familiar portrayal of cruelty. Um, does anybody know what this is? <laughs> Probably not. This is the Battle of Solferino. Now, Solferino is actually just 250 kilometers from here. It's, you know, it's much closer than Geneva. Um, but it was the Battle of Solferino that um, Henri Dunand, um, a businessman, happened upon. He was trying to visit Napoleon for some business deal, but he saw the horrors of all these soldiers just left to die on the battlefield, unattended by medical care. And that inspired him to create the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, and in turn to launch the Geneva Conventions, an effort to, to humanize the horrible consequences of war. So, um, you know, we have a long history of art um, portraying the cruelties of the world. But we also um, have art representing a defiance, people standing up to that cruelty. So here is Banksy in Ukraine, on a wall in Ukraine, just showing the joys of life amidst the horror of indiscriminate Russian bombardment. Um, and it's not just, you know, not just the, the image that he portrayed, but it's what it inspires among Ukrainians. Um, it's a way of, of reaffirming their capacity to stand up to Putin's war crimes, to Putin's atrocities. And of course, um, he also was able to show the success of the Ukrainians, you know, the, the, the judo punch that this tiny little nation has been able to use to upend the Russian massive, massive military. Now, since my friend Ai Weiwei is going to speak um, in a moment, I thought I would also just show another act of defiance. <laughs> um, you know, this is, of course, Tiananmen Square. Um, and I'll get to Tiananmen Square again in a moment. But we also have um, performance art as a way of showing defiance. This is Pussy Riot at a Russian Orthodox church standing up to Putin's efforts to impose this traditional hearkening back to the supposedly halcyon days of, of Soviet rule and the dominance of the church um, as a way of saying, you know, no. Some of us don't want that. Some of us are beyond that. And of course, the women of Pussy Riot put up with imprisonment um, for, for their stand. Now, I don't want to pretend that art plays this role only in dictatorial countries because it also plays a very important role in democracies. So you all remember the AIDS crisis. And art played a very important role in saying in the early stages that the victims of HIV were being ignored. 
that there needed to be you know, a much more concerted effort to stand up to their plight, to find a solution, to enable them to continue living, to have lives. Um, and we, we, see, um, we see this kind of work you know, in, in many different dimensions. This is um, Mark Quinn's blood project outside the New York Public Library. Um, and here the, the message was, the blood of Syrian refugees is indistinguishable from the blood of all of us. We're all humans. We should be welcoming the refugees just as we all have a place in these societies. Or in a, you know, a particularly apt reminder today, you know, as we suddenly see you know, yet another black man beaten to death by the police in the United States, the George Floyd murder spawned art to show you know, the importance of, of this neglected form of brutality even within a democracy. Now, in many ways, I think the most interesting art is the art of indirection. And by that I mean the artist who is trying to operate in a repressive environment and to say something that the censors won't pick up on. They're trying to deliver a message that has meaning but is subtle enough that the censors don't quite know what to do with it. And somehow the message gets through. And the most recent case of this, you may not even recognize as art, but I like to think of it in those terms. These are the blank paper protests that took place in China during um, these recent protests against Xi Jinping's zero COVID lockdowns. They were spawned by the death of 10 people in Xinjiang, the Northwestern Territory of China, which many people thought was due to the fact that they had been locked in their apartment building because of these COVID lockdowns during a fire. And the authorities placed a greater priority on not spreading COVID over rescuing the people. And this just showed the utter inhumanity of these lockdowns. But in China, you can't stand up with a sign and saying, I'm against you know, Xi Jinping's COVID lockdown. You get arrested immediately. And there was a guy who tried that over a bridge in Beijing and lasted you know, for minutes. So what do people do? They held up blank pieces of paper. And the message was basically, you know what I'm going to say. I don't have to say it. <laughs> you know, just think. And that, you know, for me, illustrates the creativity of art in a dictatorship. The importance of using indirection in a way that communicates a message that otherwise you couldn't say directly. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you understand this image, um, but Winnie the Pooh has come to be equated in China with Xi Jinping. They both look a little roly-poly. <laughs> and so when people portray Winnie the Pooh, in China they think of Xi Jinping. <laughs> to the point that you cannot post Winnie the Pooh on Weibo, on Chinese social media. It immediately gets wiped out. Today, you can't even post a blank sheet of paper on Weibo because they know that you know what it means. <laughs> so, you know, this is the battle of creativity that art represents that dictators hate. And so, you know, if we think about autocracy as an effort to, imp to, to essentially impose enforced conformity, you can understand why they hate the artist. Because creativity stresses human agency. The artistic process reflects people's ability to shape their future. You know, art reflects the inner freedom that we all have 
that dictators, much as they try, can never suppress. That, for me, is why art gives us hope. So long as we can create, so long as we can think, we retain the seeds to our freedom. Nobody can take that away from us. And that is a terrifying thought to an autocrat. Thank you. Now we understand we have time for a few questions, so, okay. Seems to be very complicated. <laughs> Tomas. <laughs> so I jump in. Okay. You're always shy, Tomas. <laughs> uh, you talked about the autocrats as a, a category of people and the category of, a, like, a political category. And now I want to ask you, I'm not a communist or a socialist, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, but I would like to ask you, what is the role of the very, very rich in these countries to support, create, and perpetuate an autocratic regime? What is your experience there and what are the possibilities to to counter these developments yeah well Tomas, let me um, respond in two ways to your, your good question um, one is that i don't subscribe to this view of the people there is no such thing as the people i mean that's a nice communist idea but you know as as president gauk would know very well um it's an abstraction you know when people talk about the people as if you know, there's just one answer to that one, you're in trouble. You know, that, that, that sounds like, you know, some dictator who's going to interpret the people as what he's trying to do. You know, and that's, that's the classic language of the autocrat. So I think it's important for us to recognize that people are a diversity of views, ideas, perspectives, backgrounds, and that what we have to uphold is that individuality, the right of every person to have an opinion, a political view, an expression, a group of friends, not the people, which is dangerous. Now, in terms of, you know, what is the role of the rich? Um, I mean, again, I, I tend to be, um, I think we have to be a little more qualified than that. Um, you have rich people who have benefited from oligarchic rule. You know, look, look at the, the kleptocrats around Putin, look at the Egyptian military that is benefiting from, from Sisi, you know, look at cer certain Turkish businessmen who are benefiting from Erdogan. So, yes, some people benefit from this and perpetuate it. Um, other people very much recognize the problem. You know, wealthy people recognize the problem. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to say many you know, wealthy people support Human Rights Watch and help us fight back against that. So I, I don't... Um, I do think that, that money plays too big a role today in democracy, particularly in the United States. And here, you know, we have a problem of the US Supreme Court having interpreted the Constitution to allow endless spending of money, which does tend to corrupt the electoral process. And it makes um, representatives in Congress extremely concerned about raising money. And even though everybody's smart enough to do, never do a quid pro quo, you know, I'll take your money and you, I'll give you, you know, X in return. That's bribery. But, you know, unspoken exchanges of that sort, understandings occur all the time. And, you know, sadly, in the U.S., you have, you know, an ultra-conservative Supreme Court that is not inclined to change that. And you have a very difficult process for amending the Constitution, which essentially is impossible. So we are in we've trouble today. Now, it's not inconceivable that, you know, a Congress that was not as evenly divided might still try to legislate. But even for the moment, that's not in the cards. So it is, you know, an, an unremedied problem 
in the U.S. that you're pointing to, which, you know, fortunately is not as severe a problem in this continent. Okay. One more question. Up. I hope I can articulate this <laughs> without getting too nervous, but to stay on the theme of hope, um, as I see and I think of these autocrats, I feel like they are isolating themselves and they are destroying any dissidents around them. So what is the future hope for the next generation of leaders in these countries as the young people are fleeing from these places? What can we expect, especially us young people, what could be our role to reinstill or to reinstate democracy in places like this? As, as I mentioned, um, anybody that is a dissident is being basically wiped out by these and Xi Jinping and Putin just keep isolating themselves. Yeah, I mean, you're right that, you know, the autocratic strategy is to get rid of all the troublemakers. You know, put a few in prison and hope the rest just flee the country and you're left with a nice, compliant, placid population. That's the theory. In fact, the people who are discontent with autocratic rule are not just a handful of dissidents. You know, those photos that I showed of these mass uprisings in autocratic country after autocratic country shows that this discontent is popular. Um, now, that doesn't mean the autocrat loses immediately because they do have a monopoly of, of power. You know, they can shoot people. But it's very difficult to retain power over the long term solely through brute force. You know, that's why autocrats put so much effort into censorship, into propaganda, because they're trying to shape the, you know, the public discussion sufficiently so that the mass majority of people just accept that they're doing the best they can in a difficult circumstance and they're looking out for us. You know, that's the ideology that they try to portray, but that's not the reality. And that's why I'm hopeful, because you know, when, when the only way you can stay in power is through censorship and propaganda, that is a very weak read to be standing upon. And it's not enough to get rid of the dissidents. You gotta get rid of all the people, and that's not gonna do much. You know, you can, yes, you can imagine yourself you know, president for life over an empty country, but that's not what these people aspire to. <laughs> you know? And so I think because we have truth, because we have values, because we have you know, individuality, because we have artistic freedom on our side, that our side has reason for hope, you know, not just abstract fake hope, but, but genuine grounded hope. And, and that's what has you know, kept me doing what I do for all these years, but it's also what I, I think is the reality. And so you know, if I um, you know, had a choice between you know, choosing some autocratic leader's shoes to be in or not, that's not where I would go. It is a lonely, dangerous position to be in one that does not have a great future attached to it. Thank you all. Thank you.